My name is Rick Hendricks. I'm a New Mexico State historian, and uh, I've been talking about um, the trip that uh, Robert Martinez and I took to Mexico City to do research in October of this year. I'm Robert Martinez. I'm the assistant state historian of New Mexico, and I've done research for New Mexico's Mexican period at the Archivo General de la Nación in Mexico City and also did genealogical research there for New Mexico ancestors. Ron, Ron Miara and I are so excited to have, this is our first joint meeting between HGRC and NMGS. And you know, if we continue to get crowds as big as this one, I think it's a good idea. <clears throat> and that's the whole purpose of this is to get more people collaborating on their genealogies, partnering with other groups, and today we have a fantastic speaker, but I think the rest of the year our speakers are just as good and as fantastic. <laughs> no pun intended. So um, welcome. My name is Henrietta Martinez Christmas. I am president of the New Mexico Genealogical Society. I have some announcements. There's some other people that have announcements, and then we'll turn the program over to Rick. Um, our April 2nd meeting has changed topics. We're going to now have Elmer Maestas talk about his new book, New Mexico's Stormy History, True Stories of Early Spanish Colonial Settlers in the Maestas and Maestas families. And then the World War I lecture has now moved to August. So that will be April 2nd here at Botts Hall next month. On March 9th, which is next week at 10.30 a.m. at the main library at um, Fifth and Copper, Mary Penner, <coughs> who's our NMGS editor, will be teaching a class on preserving and sharing your research. Mary is an award-winning author. She used to write for the Tribune, um, and she does a really nice job on the NMGS journal. So if you're interested in writing a book or something, uh, it's free and open to the public, so check that out. Um, NMGS has some new books out. We have a Santa Clara baptism book, an 1830 Taos confirmation book. We have, we're uh, indexing San Juan de los Caballeros baptisms. And we have an Anton Chico book that Father Hendren started. And I have some order forms in the pink up here at the front if anyone's interested. I did not bring books with me today. We also have a flyer, wherever Jean ended up sitting over here, for our event in May when we're bringing in uh, Dr. Fritz Jungling from the Family History Library in Salt Lake City to do an all-day event on German research and how to use the Family History website. And I'm actually looking forward to that. I've taken classes from him before, and he's just really, really good. Um, and he is their star player in Salt Lake when it comes to German uh, research. So Dr. Rick Hendricks, I call him Rick, <laughs> is our New Mexico state historian. For those of you that don't know, most states don't have state historians. We are very blessed to have one. Rick received his BA from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 1977 and his PhD from UNM in 85. He is former editor of the Vargas Project at the UNM, at UNM, and then after that conclusion of the, what, 20 years of editing the books, he worked at New Mexico State University working on the Durango Microfilm Project, all things that genealogists use. At NMSU, Rick taught courses in colonial Latin America and Mexican history. He's written extensively on the history of American Southwest and Mexico. And his assistant state historian, Rob Martinez, is also here, and he will also speak a little bit today. And they're currently working on projects, researching information on the Mexican governors of New Mexico. And I want to say there's like 18 Mexican governors in 20 years or something. <laughs> and also working on Catholic priesthood in the late colonial New Mexico. Now his topic today will be a research trip that they took in October to Mexico City. And I'm going to just turn it over to Rick. Thank you. Okay. Rob and I are profoundly grateful for the support that um, we were given by the genealogical community. Um, 
I hope that you know you supported our uh, research. Uh, <clears throat> we had some support from the state and we had support for um, uh, lodging and, and food. Um, I think we were good stewards of your money. Um, and um, so, um, and I want to tell you a little story too before I get going. About 20 years ago, um, I spoke to a genealogical group uh, in this very spot one evening. Um, and I was talking about the work that we were doing on the Vargas Project. We were uh, working to identify all the families that came to New Mexico with uh, Diego de Vargas uh, and the various recruiting expeditions. And I mentioned while I was talking that um, we were trying to get it back basically um, to the parents of the people who came just to sort of give a feel for where they fit in um, colonial Mexican society and that we had a lot of additional research that we would probably never be publishing that, was, that we had gathered. A few people came up afterwards and they said, well, we're, we're really interested in, in what you're doing with the Vargas Project, but what we'd really like to see is the research on the families that you're not planning to publish. <laughs> and that evening changed my life uh, in a very profound way because um, from that time forward, um, I've had uh, a wonderful warm relationship with uh, the uh, Hispanic genealogical community here in New Mexico. Um, uh, we've shared uh, information and meals and entertainment and lots of things over the years and it's been very rewarding to me um, to do that. Um, and you, you may or may not know that, that um, I'm now considered one of the few academic historians um, who actually uh, embraces genealogical research. Um, so uh, it's, it, that's been kind of an interesting uh, past two or three decades. <clears throat> What I'm going to do with the slideshow is I'm going to take you on the research trip with us um, since you couldn't be along. Um, this is a trip of uh, every morning we would get up and have a quick breakfast and we would walk the 45 minutes to the archive. Um, we would work all day in the archive and then we would walk back. Um, this slideshow um, is basically the trip to the archive, some work in the archive, and then back. Okay, this is a typical day. Um, we were in Mexico City for two weeks. Um, <clears throat> while you're looking at that, I'm going to be um, talking uh, about various things that um, primarily Henrietta wanted me to address um, uh, relative to um, doing research in Mexico, uh, uh, how to prepare for it, um, what we accomplished, what our experience was like. Um, and so if you're really not interested in what I have to say, maybe you'll enjoy the photographs. <laughs> so uh, here we're going to go. Um, this should just go. OK, so um, the first thing that um, I was asked to talk a little bit about um, was um, how to prepare for such a trip. Um, and one of the things that, um, that I would recommend is that you spend um, a lot more time preparing to do a research trip to Mexico than you plan to spend while you're there. Um, what we did in particular, the focus of our research was the, the project that we're currently engaged on, which is the Mexican governors of New Mexico, the, the individuals who govern New Mexico from 1821 to the American invasion in 1846. Okay, so those are the people that we were really focused on. Um, we didn't go with a specific mention of a mission of finding genealogical information. However, um, we both spent a lot of time looking for um, New Mexicans in general uh, when we weren't looking for <coughs> material on the governors. So um, in here, 
<coughs> in New Mexico, um, most of you are familiar with the, the materials that are in the state archives, the Spanish, <coughs> Spanish archives of New Mexico 1 and 2, the Mexican archives, and then the wealth of material that's at UNM. So if you were planning to go <coughs> anywhere in Mexico to do research, um, I would highly recommend that you determine uh, what they already have um, so you wouldn't necessarily duplicate um, that. Um, since Rob and I were, were particularly interested in um, a slice of history, um, we spent a lot of time going through um, the Mexican archives and UNM's collection on that period. Um, the other thing is that there is online, many of you probably already know, um, the Archivo General de la Nación has a website um, and it's a little bit tricky to use, but you can search um, their online catalog um, and, and you can do name searches on it. Um, but what Rob and I found when we got there um, is that the, the one that's available online um, is no longer used by the archive. Um, and it is also, uh, the, and the one that they currently use is in the second generation, <coughs> soon to be the third generation. So you can still find citations, but when you take those citations, they're not the way they cite them today. And so they'll say, where did you get that? Um, and they say, oh, we got that off the website. Well, we don't use that anymore. Uh, but they can convert the old citations to the new citations. This is actually nothing new in the archive world. Um, uh, many archives um, will re-catalog their material. Um, and so um, that currently is the only, only way that you can do um, online research for um, that archive. Um, Increasingly, um, <clears throat> Mexican regional archives also have online guides that you can search. Um, and uh, I don't know um, whether they're having the same situation of um, making them not available. Um, in the case of a very few documents in the current system that's online, you can actually see the digitized documents. A handful of them you can see, most of them you can't. Um, and uh, in Mexico City, they're, um, and, and indeed all over Mexico, they're very rapidly digitizing their collections. Um, and um, when, once the collection is digitized, um, you can no longer see the original document. And, and that's the process that they're, they're moving forward with. Um, so those are the things that basically you can do to prepare um, the collections we already have here. Um, and you uh, look at the collection that they have online. Um, another question that um, uh, Henrietta asked me to address is how safe is it to go to Mexico to do research? And it is a consideration that if, if you are seriously thinking about doing it. When Rob and I were there, um, we, this facility is very close to the old historic district downtown. <clears throat> they are currently experiencing um, um, the highest uh, incidence of uh, crime in that area since 2007. Um, there are many, many more people in that area than, than there were the last time either one of us was there. Um, and um, uh, there, it, it can be dangerous, but we certainly did not encounter any situations. And we were, as you've noticed, we were passing through some rather grim neighborhoods in order to get to the archive. Um, in, and for example, if you're talking about a regional archive in a place like Zacatecas or Guadalajara, um, you would have to weigh the, the the risk to your personal safety. Um, <clears throat> Guadalajara, um, which is a, a place where there is actually a fair amount of material that relates to New Mexico, um, is considered by the US State Department to be one of the most dangerous places you can travel. So it is a consideration. Um, I wouldn't advise anybody um, go um, and do what we did um, by yourself 
take somebody with you. Um, because we were doing sort of the classic thing you're not supposed to do, repeating the same pattern every day. We got up at the same time we left. We walked the same way. Um, and uh, so that it is something that you could consider. Again, we didn't have any, there were no incidents that, in, that involved us, but it is something that you need to think about. <clears throat> the process now, and these are just some of the documents that we were looking at. The process now is that if you go to almost any archive in Mexico, you are going to do your own copying. Um, this is something that's happening increasingly in the archive world, it's true. Uh, now in a lot of facilities. It's true in the National Archives here. And what that means is that um, you have to have a camera, uh, a digital camera or to, to take the photographs. Um, uh, you're not allowed to use a scanner of any kind. Um, they will not make any copies. Um, and you're not allowed to use a copy stand. So the, cop, the, photo, the photography that you're doing is sort of uh, handheld, um, and we were doing it. We were doing about six hours straight, um, holding the camera over the document, um, and that's about all you can do. Um, and um, the other thing that we learned, and this was very much a learning experiment because it's a new environment. Um, let me just run it again. Yeah. Oh, okay. <clears throat> In case you missed something, then we'll run it again. <clears throat> um, most of the books that have not, most of the documents that have not been scanned are bound in books. And so there's a big issue with the gutter and the material bound in the gutter. Um, and when you're using a camera with a standard lens, which is what we were using, um, you lose a lot of information in the gutter. Okay? <clears throat> so if you think you're going to be going somewhere to do some um, serious archival research, you need to investigate lenses that have a little bit more um, ability. The human eye can actually sort of bend around the curve. Um, a standard lens won't. Um, and we think that probably a strap that would enable you to anchor the camera um, would be a good idea because after a bunch of hours of just holding the camera, you start to get movement. And some of the images that we have are not pristine because of our uh, technique, I guess you could say. Um, you can no longer order microfilm. Um, and so you're pretty much uh, what you can do yourself. Um, the other thing uh, I would say is that you need to have some way to, uh, the process that we use, we would film all day and then when we would go back to the hotel at night, we downloaded um, the, the images um, onto um, a thumb drive um, and, and to a laptop so that we had backups. Um, we had, our IT department had had the idea that we would have all the images go automatically to Dropbox, but the Wi-Fi was so terrible um, that we were unable to do that. So if you, if you think, if you're very tech savvy and you think you're going to store it all in the cloud, probably you're not. So you need to have a solution that's not quite so high tech. Um, now, <clears throat> um, we, in, in some of the information that you got, it was indicated that we brought back 2,800 documents. What we actually brought back was 2,800 images, which is still a lot of material, but 2,800 documents could be thousands and thousands and thousands of pages. <clears throat> Currently, we're in the process of making a catalog of that material. <clears throat> and um, what the way that documentation is going to be available to any of you folks who have an interest in it is that we will be um, printing all of the images out in color. Um, and they'll be in files. And they'll be available at the state archives in Santa Fe. 
The reason that we have to do it that way is that when you go into the archive, you are required to sign a document that indicates that you will not um, basically put the material, publish the material, put it on the web or anything like that. Um, so it will be available, um, but it, it will be available um, in, in Santa Fe. Um, we are in the process now of um, creating descriptions of all the documents, and that is a little bit of a time-consuming process. So now Rob and I are going to do this, but it's just going to take a little bit longer because of the fact that we also have other stuff that we have to do. Um, so uh, just to, I'm going to have Rob come up here and talk in a minute uh, specifically about some genealogical information that we found, but I wanted to tell you uh, some other things that we found. Um, we were focusing on the governors, uh, these Mexican period governors, and we did find a lot of material on them. Um, actually, we were surprised to how much. Um, there's an oft, oftentimes people say that um, New Mexico was really, uh, that the Mexican government was not really interested in New Mexico and, um, and actually that's not true. There was a lot of documentation that was flowing back and forth. I think that um, probably something happened um, to part of the Mexican archive, uh, maybe a good part of it. Um, uh, and the vicissitudes of time and chance, um, maybe Governor Pyle gave, that was some of the stuff that was given away to the meat sellers, but at any rate, <clears throat> There, is, there was quite a bit of that material, and we also found a lot of, we were looking also at other, um, the Spanish period governors, and we found a lot of really fascinating material about that as well. Um, but um, we, we, in terms of genealogical, specifically genealogical material, um, there are a couple things. Um, Henrietta has already um, worked through some um, presidial records, um, and we'll, then they'll be published um, um, maybe in the summer or sometimes. Um, and, and there was actually uh, material um, in these military records that we didn't have here in New Mexico. Um, so adding a little bit um, of family history uh, about people who served in the presidio. And, and as we've started to go through the other documents, um, we've, we've discovered that there's uh, a good a good bit more of that, so there'll be more of that forthcoming. And then Rob is going to come, Rob, Rob is going to talk to you about um, some material that that he, he found and that he and Jose Esquivel have worked on an article which I, is also going to be forthcoming soon, next week. Um, so Rob. Good morning. Buenos dias le de Dios. Um, if you're curious, those are archive cats, all right? <laughs> um, they're everywhere in the uh, Archivo General de la Nación, and you just can't uh, help but take pictures of them. They're so cute. But um, they serve a purpose. They probably take care of rodents and vermin, all kinds of strange creatures that might eat documents. Um, we're all genealogists here, we're all historians, and um, whenever I've gone on a trip, whether it's with uh, Rick Hendricks to Mexico City, uh, I was just in Havana, Cuba with Stan Hortys uh, working on his project, you know, you can't help but always be thinking genealogy, 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 you know, and I have a lot of experience, Rick has a ton of experience, but uh, we were talking about this the other day at lunch, you know. No matter how many times I go to these archives in Mexico City, Zacatecas, Puerto Rico, Madrid, Sevilla, I still have this fantasy that I'm going to walk in and tell them, my name's Roberto Martinez, I'm here to do genealogy on Spanish colonists in New Mexico, and that the archivists are going to say, oh yeah, we have a big box in the back where we've been keeping all those documents. And I'm going to go, wow, wh why do you have all those documents? They say, well, you know, we've just been going through our, our papers here, and uh, no one else has ever seen these documents, and just, we, we just put them together about an hour ago, and now you get to see them. 
and then bring them to your friends in New Mexico. Well, it's not really like that, folks. It really isn't. Um, uh, we uh, went to Mexico City, as Rick said, to do work on our Mexican period, but always with an open mind to finding other things. And very early on in our trip, we were, uh, after a hard day of work, probably the first day, we were in our restaurant, our hotel restaurant, uh, sitting down, uh, eating a nice meal, and uh, drinking our uh, glasses of milk that we drank every <laughs> night with our meal. And, um, you know, Rick pointed out, he goes, you know, we're here, we, we have our plan, but, you know, let's not forget we're here uh, working uh, for a genealogy group, and so let's make sure we uh, keep that in mind while we're doing our research. Um, and as Rick said, they have a really, uh, it's a very effective electronic finding aid uh, there right in the archive. So you could type in names and it will bring them up. So the first thing I did was uh, start thinking, well, you know, where is there a brick wall or an adobe wall, as Henrietta says. And the first uh, family that came to mind was the uh, Vega y Coca family. I always know, well, we have, the, we have the couple, but we can't seem to get the family back. So... I, uh, when we were at the archive, I typed in the name and I found uh, a matrimonio. They have matrimonios there and um, they look like diligencias, but I still can't tell if they're uh, religious documents or civil documents because they didn't have civil marriage there, but it might be a docu documents uh, just for uh, uh, purposes of estate and uh, money and dowries. I'm not sure. but. Uh, the, the family popped up. There they were. So I found it. I took down the pertinent information and, uh, as Rick said, took pictures in a very awkward angle. It was very painful to our backs to have to do that for six hours. But I, I got these images and then um, uh, we had always, you know, retired to our hotel rooms and I had my little iPad there and I'm on the internet and um, I shot Jose Esquivel an email because I know he works with the Vega y Coca family from the big yellow and red book he and Jack Colligan put together. So I say, you know, what do you got? <laughs> what do you got on this family? I want to see if he has what I got, okay? So he shoots back, well, all, all we have is the, the couple, Cristobal and Marina, but um, he had some other notes that he had accumulated over the years of people he suspected were this family. And I said, well, look what I found. And then um, he says, he sends me an uh, email automatically uh, saying something like, holy blank, you know, uh, that's exactly what we need to connect these families. So uh, a neat little dialogue started. Um, I would take notes on these uh, documents and I'd say, well, whatever other brick walls you might have, send them to me. And then I got on the HGRC site looking for anything I can remember where we'd, we had brick walls brick walls and started looking for these families. Um, it became kind of a, a ritual. We're going back and forth. Rick and I were accumulating all these images of uh, governors and governance, and we would be downloading them onto his computer so we could uh, save them. But it became kind of uh, frantic. You know, every night I'd be sitting there in my hotel room watching uh, uh, Game of Thrones and Walking Dead in Spanish. Well, I'm, well, we're trying to get as many of these families as we can. And um, the thing is, is it's, it's quite amazing. Um, what I was able to do was get uh, the marriage record of uh, Cristobal uh, de la Vega and Marina, Marina Coca. We couldn't, the reason you can't make the connection on this end is because in, in that document, which lists her parents and his parents, um, she doesn't go under the name Coca. She goes under the name Valdez Coca, okay? So it's just those little breakthroughs you get in genealogy that all of a sudden opens the floodgate because it listed her family. So I ran back into the computer, typing in the parents' names of these folks, and then I found her parents' matrimonio that's in the um, uh, Archivo General de la Nación, the National Archives, okay? And then, of course, from there you could start putting it together and, you know, you just start going back and forth on emails, me and Jose, and um, we start kind of slowly piecing this family together. Um, he also sent me, does anybody hear a descent from a family called Marquez de Ayala? Marquez de Ayala, okay. One person, two, three. Some people are a little embarrassed, but it's okay. They're a good family, don't worry. Um, um, uh, 
we found um, his uh, marriage record, the matrimonio, uh, and that lists his parents too. So you guys know the drill. This is the sort of stuff we were finding. Um, we did our best, both Rick and I, were go we, were, we were talking every evening and uh, going back and forth, sharing ideas and sharing notes and taking these families as far back as we could. Um, but I got to tell you, between uh, the work that uh, Rick Hendricks, Jack Colligan, uh, Jose Esquivel, um, the stuff uh, we did with Stan Hordes 15, 20 years ago, um, some of the people in this room right here, um, a lot has been exhausted. I mean, we really combed through the records over there at the National Archives in Mexico City. That digital finding guide is very helpful. They've extracted names from all the documents. So even if you're looking for somebody who's not going to show up in a major document like a marriage, they turn up as witnesses. I looked up Agustin Jeronimo Aragon because he's one of our guys he can't get back. I, I couldn't find a marriage uh, document for him, but I found him as a witness, so that was helpful. It was something like 1612, and it gives his age. Um, and I think somebody has found a pasajero record for him, and the age really kind of makes it true. It makes it uh, more concrete than we knew before. So that's some of the stuff you find now. Um, I found Antonio Moya, he, uh, uh, the Moya family, um, he and his brother Pedro Moya were carpinteros, uh, al lado de la catedral, the documents say, right to the side of the cathedral. And it, um, an interesting document shows that they were the guys who were building the scaffolding used in the Auto de Fe of 1649 in Mexico City. So there's all these interesting connections and uh, amazing uh, social and cultural and economic information you can get from these documents. Um, when I went to Havana, uh, Jose Esquivel said, well, the only person we know is Antonio Moya's uh, uh, father, what he, or he was maybe even born out, uh, but, there, but his father was, I think it was Juan uh, Moreno. They were Moreno. And we couldn't find, um, we could not find any information on them. However, um, like Rick says, you have to be prepared for surprises when you do this kind of work. For example, um, we have how many citations for the notarias in Mexico City? Uh, several dozen. We have several dozen, and we just couldn't get into that archive. We couldn't get in. Um, in Havana with Stan, we were there eight years ago. We had our visas, but they were the wrong visas, so we could get into the cathedral there and work on genealogies, but we could not get into the national archives in Cuba. This time we went we could get into the National Archives because we had the correct visa, but now the cathedral has rules that say you cannot look at the documents. Um, the lady said, um, you have to go talk to the archbishop. We went to the archbishop's office in Havana. We got a nice letter from uh, uh, the chancellor, um, a Jesuit no less, you know, and he, we took it and it said, uh, let these people um, have information from the cathedral. I said, here, we have our letter. And the lady looked at it. She goes, well, this just means I can get you information, but you can't look at the documents. So we had to give her a list of all the names of the people we're looking for. And she got us a lot of marriage records and baptismal records. But it's, it changes. No matter how much you plan, things can change without your knowing, OK? Um, so you have to be aware of that. But um, I have the article that's coming out in a week um, that gets the family back um, for the Co Vega y Coca family um, back roughly one, two, three generations. All right? See? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, there's other stuff. Uh, I got a matrimonio for Nicolás Tejeda Girón. Um, it doesn't give us any new uh, genealogy, but it's still another document that you can add to your collection um, that we'll eventually have copies of. Um, I found some promising leads, as we call them. Uh, a lot of, I found a few documents for Garcia de la Riva over there, Garcia de la, las Rivas. 
Again, I found a Moreno document. I looked for Antonio Silva. Couldn't find anything on him, but I found an Antonio, Antonio Silva a, a couple generations back. Could be his grandfather. I got it just in case. That's another thing you do. You know, you, you can't help but grab these documents. Rick and I experienced that. You, you, we had our citations, but then you're looking at something and you get the five page citation, right Rick? Now all of a sudden you turn a page and there's like 50 more pages about New Mexico. Well, you can't just leave that. You know, you can't, oh well, you know, we'll come back. So we're taking pictures of all this stuff. And the reason it's taking us a little longer is we have to put together, the citation is easy. It's just the expedientes or collection of documents following the, the citation we have. The question is, what's it about? What does it say? So we're having to go through and put all that together. Um, but this is the kind of stuff we came up with. And I think I'm going to stop talking now. Did you want to talk more, Rick? I just want to say one thing. Um, and this was something that we wanted to be sure that we, we got across to you. Um, uh, we were provided with enough resources to make a subsequent trip, we believe, if we can get, we, we, we don't have any more state funding, so we'll have to come up with another piece, but we could probably do that. But, and, and I'm sure that a lot of what Rob said was, is exciting and, and you think, wow, if I could just get my ancestor. Um, we really believe that in this two week period, at least for the time being, um, we wouldn't go back to the National Archive to pursue this research. Um, we will be trying to get permission to get into the archive that wouldn't even deign to respond to our request. Um, and we will try to get permission to get access to the military archive, which will also have uh, should have um, a lot of interesting New Mexico material. Um, but that's a process. Um, and the other thing is that we also feel like uh, we really need to work through the documents that we brought back before we try to collect any more. Um, because you can get in the habit. Um, um, Rob and I are working on this project about the governors. And, I, and you know, most of you know I worked for many years on the Durango microfilming project. So I said I was going to be down in Las Cruces for a few days and I said I'll just peek and see what might be in the priest's correspondence about that Mexican period. And so for, for two days I spent the all day long uh, copying um, those documents because there were literally hundreds of pages of material that I had just never gotten to before. So. Um, you know, there's a few hundred pages of that and 2,800 pages of this. Uh, so uh, I guess that's about all. Um, actually, we've run over probably what you wanted us to do.